<laughs> Members of the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor. Meeting of the City of Adelaide on Tuesday, 28th of March 2017. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any, and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council including transferring outside of Australia. The red light to my right indicates that the meeting is being filmed and streamed. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains. Pays respect to orders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide, the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised in the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Members, ladies and gentlemen, I ask that you remain standing in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country at sea, on land and in the air. Members, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <laughs> Members, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the meeting of the 28th of March 2017. Thank you for joining us. Members, good to see you. I would like to move on, if I could, members, to apologies and leave of absence. Uh, we have two apologies this evening, members. We have Councillor Abiyad and we have a late apology from Councillor Wilkinson. I'll take you on to item six on your agendas, members, which is the uh, confirmation minutes from our last meeting held on the 14th of March 2017. Members, can I please have a mover? Councillor Slama. Can I have a seconder, please, members, for those minutes? Councillor Martin. Uh, any debate, members, regarding the minutes of previous meeting? Summing up, Councillor Slama, I'll put that to the floor. Those in favour, members, are carrying those minutes. Those against will carry those minutes. Thank you very much, members. Members, we have one, I'll take you on to item seven, which is uh, public forums and deputations. Uh, we have no public forums this evening, but we do have one deputation. Uh, it's regarding an item on your agenda this evening, members, so I'd like to invite Mr. Martin Radcliffe to the uh, podium and uh, extend the courtesy of five minutes, which may be followed by questions from the members. Mr. Radcliffe, welcome to Adelaide City Council Chamber. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Lord Mayor and councillors, for allowing me the opportunity to present again today. As we know, when Council last reviewed this matter in November, a resolution was reached to support the drop-off at the main King William Street entrance of the Mayfair Hotel. Uh, this is reflective of the city's expectation, or the expectations of the city's leading luxury hotel with a high number of interstate and international guests that visited. Since this point, as was the advice of Council, the Mayfair Hotel has worked closely with Council administration as to the most appropriate design. We're really appreciative of this dialogue. Subsequently, uh, it is pleasing that we are on the same page uh, as identified by the recommendation provided to you by the Director of Operations and the Chief Executive Officer to approve a modified indentation to the footpath. I'll summarise this proposal and the rationale for you now. Primarily, 
The Mayfair Hotel has a concern that a drop-off without any indent from the main traffic lane could represent a public safety concern, specifically for those alighting from the driver's side of vehicles. Prior to the Mayfair getting up and running and my time there, we acknowledged it was simply buses stopping at its location, alighting from the left-hand side. However, given our visitor and guest mix now, it will be predominantly guest-driven vehicles, both self and valet, followed by taxis and chauffeured vehicles using this space, with occupants opting to exit their vehicles at both sides. The width, traffic volume and traffic speeds associated with Adelaide's King William Street give the Mayfair concern for the safety of these passengers. There are indeed some larger city centres around the world where comparisons may be drawn, where lower speed limits and wider main boulevards than Adelaide are a factor. New York's a notable example whose 25 miles per hour speed limit is some 10 kilometres per hour lower than Adelaide's. Central London, as we understand, now moves towards a 20 mile per hour limit in its city centre. Both cities have iconic hotels with and without indented drop-offs. We are also fully considered the alternative example raised at the November meeting, I believe it was Councillor Wilkinson, of the Adena Treasuries Hotel drop-off on Flinders Street. We found, however, that this was a designated vehicle drop-off within a zone of the road not used for traffic. Very different, of course, to the environment for the Mayfair on King William Street and indeed Hilton Adelaide on Victoria Square and the Mercure Grosvenor on North Terrace. With public safety in mind, we worked with administration to propose modified options for an indented drop-off. These occupying a smaller area of footpath than our original proposal and we trust more palatable to Council. I see these have been included in your papers together with my letter. These designs would also support the Mayfair ad activating dedicated staff to this area to ensure good maintenance and also minimum time required by alighting vehicles. If it becomes more appealing to stop there, more guests are going to stop there, hence we, need, we would place more staff at that entrance. Just last week, our management team met with the hotel's owners at Dabco Properties. They're very encouraged by the recent direction of the city and indeed the Mayfair. To this end, our owners are now looking at further investment and development of the hotel making it clear to us that a prominent and safe main entrance on King William Street, one that meets the expectations of the international traveller, is pivotal to this ongoing and further investment. It's our strong view this proposal would manage both a safe environment for the public visiting the hotel and also enhance the vibrancy of King William Street, projecting an image of a cosmopolitan international city as well as one that respects its character and its heritage. We hope that you support this proposal and a recommendation of council administration so that we may continue to work together with administration to move forward on this basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Radcliffe. Members, do you have any questions you might like to ask Mr. Radcliffe about his deputation? Councillor Milani. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Martin. Um, Martin, I was just looking at the um, two um, designs that were provided. Um, that you said are attached to my papers, and one has a greater indentation than, than the other. Mm. Um, can you just share with me one of my concerns that I'm picking up on your point was the dr driver side, that, that the King William Street side. Um, what would the difference be in terms of, I'm, I've, I've got some concern if the indentation isn't mm. great enough, there is a risk there, which is what I think you're saying. Can you just give me some more detail on that? Are you suggesting that it has to be the greater indentation that oh. is safer? And have you got some feedback on that? We'd certainly prefer the original proposal, but we understand that that wasn't approved. The original proposal was a three metre indentation. The 1.5 and two metre just take the, the driver's side of those vehicles just that little bit further away from that 50 kilometre per hour traffic. We'd love to say to all of our guests, please get out of the left-hand side of your vehicle and manage that in advance, but we just can't. They will take that choice to get out of that driver's side on some occasions. So the two metre is preferable of the two for us. We, we were asked to come up with two options and we agreed that with uh, council administration. When you've come up with that second option though, uh, based on the feedback, have you, I get the difference is about 1.5 metres. Yeah. I do my maths, but do you know how realistically that protrudes into the traffic and how close the, the driver would be to come in close to the traffic, particularly if they 
swing in to go left into that left yeah. lane on to go left onto hind leg. The main thing is it takes that little bit further away from that the, the lane next to the one that the car has just pulled up with. But you've modelled the 1.5 version and you think that's... That's, that's doable and we work doable. with our architects on that basis. Okay, and can you just talk to me about the... Um, uh, you're looking to sort of upgrade that area with planter boxes and, and yeah. the, um, the mosaic. Can you just talk about what that, that looks like? Is that like a, is it an art piece or is it something that is just a... <laughs> No, um, what, what is it? The, 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 the suggestion of our architect was we a red carpet was never considered the right alternative. We didn't want people tripping over that, and that's quite old hat these days. So, on the advice of, of council, we worked with our architect and came up with what we thought would be a palatable option, very good branding for the hotel, classy look for the street. Uh, I do believe from their recommendation of council that that's not preferred from their perspective, but we believe that that would be a nice way to just uh, make that statement that here is the Mayfair Hotel, here's where you're arriving as an international visitor. I, I get that from your yeah. side, but is it is it like a, there's a difference between just a logo and a pavement of something that's it's artistic. Can you just define if it's anything amazing that you've got in mind there? Oh, uh, it's, the, it's as you can see on the diagram, it's just the Mayfair logo, the lion. So it's a mosaic. I'm just trying to ask the Thank you, Councillor Mulaney. Councillor Martin, you had your hand up for a question for Mr Radcliffe. Yes, I was just a bit uncertain about uh, one of your comments. Thank you for your address. Um, uh, were you saying that the indentation um, may well influence the decision to proceed with another investment? Yeah. Uh, the owners have made it pretty clear to us that the, the entrance, and uh, you have to excuse me because I'm coming on board as a new general manager after the hotel was built. Had I been there before the hotel was built, maybe there would have been a different approach. But they made it very clear that a really prominent international quality entrance is pivotal to their, their considerations for future investment. Thank you. Members, do we have any further questions of Mr. Radcliffe? I don't see any hands, so I'd like to thank Mr. Radcliffe for his deputation to the City of Adelaide. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Members, item eight on your, we have no further deputations, members, and item eight on your agenda is petitions, of which we have nil. So I'm going to take your attention directly to item nine on your agendas, which is advice to note, uh, items 9.1 and uh, items 9.2. Uh, one of these, uh, 9.1, of course, is advice that's come before you, members, from APLA regarding uh, a uh, rival park car parking matter and also regarding a Victoria Park community building matter and 9.2 members is an audit committee uh, report and recommendation. So can I look to the floor members for a mover please to note Councillor Slama, seconded by Councillor Corbell. Members, do you have any questions that you would like to ask with regards to these items to note? You don't, Councillor Slama, you wish to sum up? Uh, summed up. Okay, members, I'll put this for your vote. Those, those voting in favour, those voting against, item 9.1 and 9.2 are duly carried. Thank you, members. Members, that takes us on to item 10, which is the Lord Mayor's report. Members, I'll provide you with a verbal report. The um, uh, members, the, as you're well aware, our community associations are, of course, very important to our city. Uh, I recently, on your behalf, attended a City South Association meeting as well as another meeting uh, with the East End Coordination Group at Ayers House. Also, I'd like to thank Deputy Lord Mayor Megan Hender for hosting the Lord Mayor's uh, uh, Business Engagement Forum recently. On my behalf, while I was interstate attending a Triple CLM meeting. Uh, we recently hosted a civic reception for the Adelaide Festival here at Town Hall. This year's festival had a record year with 84,600 tickets sold and 40% of the ticket sales to the headline production saw were from uh, interstate and overseas. So an outstanding result, I must say, we must say. <laughs> Members, I spoke at the Green Cities Conference in Sydney, hosted by the Green Building Council of Australia and the Property Council of Australia, uh, which is about programs and initiatives the City of Adelaide is undertaking to become carbon neutral, which I must say was very well received, members, by a very large audience. I opened the City of Adelaide Live Music Summit 
at uh, Fowler's on North Terrace to launch the engagement process with industry and to further develop our live music action plan. Thanks again to Deputy Lord Mayor Megan Hender for participating in the uh, discussion panel representing Council. On that same day, members, I also met with the Mayor of Katowice in Poland, who is another UNESCO City of Music. I'd like to thank the Deputy Lord Mayor again for hosting the civic reception for the UNESCO Creative Cities uh, also while I was uh, attending Triple CLM Interstate. Members, whilst at Triple CLM, I met with uh, Minister Josh Frydenberg, uh, Federal Minister for Environment and Energy. We also discussed important issues including climate change action, homelessness, city safety and security, CBD transformation and health and education precinct precincts. Uh, members, I've also been to the moon since I last spoke to you, where I attended a virtual reality demonstration in the Innovation Lab at our City Library. And if you have not yet done that, members, I must say it's quite an extraordinary virtual reality experience, and I recommend it. The, I attended a launch event of a, uh, a, a technology company on North Terrace called Dynamic Creative, uh, which was a terrific uh, business which is uh, working in the technology space employing some 16 people on North Terrace. Attended the launch of the new Barber Training School on uh, Heimley Street. I believe Councillor Slama might have attended a similar function of late too. St Patrick's Day also, wonderful celebration and uh, we have a very vibrant, as you know, Irish community in the City of Adelaide. Attended a Tri-Varsity Singaporean Students Welcome for our three major universities. Uh, at the Convention Centre and members, as you know, uh, we recently had another citizenship ceremony whereby 57 new citizens from 24 countries were welcomed to the City of Adelaide and I thank Councillor Martin for doing a very good job as being the MC on that occasion. Thank you. Uh, members, host an event to... Oh, I get the bell, do I? <laughs> right. Members, do I have your leave to speak for another minute? So, Thank you, Councillor Martin. <laughs> Hosts an event, members, which is a signing ceremony, which was an outcome of our relationship with the City of Qingdao, uh, whereby a new, relatively new, City of Adelaide business called Joe Long Windows and Doors, who herald from our sister city of Qingdao, who have established premises in Adelaide, have signed a joint venture with Dixon Glass to provide the doors and windows for the Kodo residential development on Angus Street. Members, the Lady Mayoress spoke at two events recently, one being International Women's Day, uh, in, and the other was a member, sorry, she spoke at the Australian Migrant Resource Centre, uh, which was an event about supporting refugees and recent migrants. Lady Mayoress and I recently have had dinner with Major Barry Casey and uh, Major Roz Casey uh, of the Salvation Army, uh, who are the newly sworn in um, uh, senior leaders of that organisation in South Australia. And the Lady Maris is working on two events for your information members, a Mother's Day event. Uh, there's some uh, community call for a Mother's Day event to be held at Town Hall. That is work in progress. Members will be informed about that duly. And also a history festival event, which will be held by during History Month, of course, here at Adelaide Town Hall. So, members, you will be provided uh, with more details about both of those events, I would imagine, by administration very shortly. And, members, for your information, further to a previous council meeting discussion and decision, uh, the Lady Mayoress will not be attending the trip to Qingdao in May 2017 this year. Can I please have someone move that verbal report, please? Councillor Corbell, thank you. Seconded by Councillor Martin. Those in favour of adopting the verbal report? We carry. Thank you very much, members. Uh, members, that takes me on to item 11, which is reports from councillors, of which we have a written report in your papers and we have a verbal report, I understand, for the Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy Lord Mayor, would you like to make your verbal report before I move to adopt both? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd actually like to report on a couple of um, activities. Um, so, firstly, um, a, um, an invitation that the women councillors uh, received recently um, from the Lyceum Club, a lovely event that we attended, um, most of those of us who were available attended, um, uh, so that uh, to increase the sort of interaction between us and the Lyceum Club and to let the um, 
female members know that I've spoken to our administration about um, whether we could do some reciprocal uh, event back here so that we can have some, whether be, that would be appropriate on getting some advice about that. Um, but the other um, report I'd like to make is a, is a verbal report about uh, the city tour that I've recently been on, or the Lord Mayor and I have recently been on with the um, Deputy Premier Minister for Planning. Some of you may remember that late last year, 15th of November, I'm, I um, amended a motion, I can't actually remember the details of the motion, but I amend, amended the motion to include a re request for the Lord Mayor to ask uh, the uh, Minister for Planning, um, the, Deputy Lord, the Deputy Premier, and the um, Government Architect to join him on a city tour. And that city tour took place last week on Wednesday. Um, and uh, given that it was my motion, I was lucky enough to attend it as well. So we had the Lord Mayor, um, myself, um, the Minister for Planning, the Government Architect, Kirstine McKay's, and some senior staff from each of the, all three organisations. And we took the Tindo. Um, and visited a number of sites just um, in the CBD because of the limitations on time. Obviously, the minister, minister's time was very limited. Anyway, it was a very fruitful discussion, and I just wanted to report briefly about it. It gave us an opportunity to really um, talk to the minister in the in the um, context of the, the current ministerial DPA, which is the design quality DPA that's out at the moment, um, and where we've already made. As you know, we've made a submission to that DPA, but we were able to to take some of the aspects of our submission and actually give them real life by showing and by you know being outside buildings and actually having a look at buildings and what work what has worked and what hasn't worked in the city and where we might use this DPA, this new DPA, as an opportunity to tighten and improve the outcomes of the city. So some of the things very briefly that we considered, and um, we had a look at. Um, the, the design, you know, what we actually need to do to achieve design excellence, and particularly um, including the, the look at the quality of materials that are used, and it became apparent from the discussions that there are times when people get approvals for buildings with excellent materials, and then after the approval they go back for a, for a change of the materials and, and de, uh, devalue the materials that they're going to use. And so we're looking at ways where that might be tightened up so that doesn't happen. We talked about um, the consideration of local amenity and scale, and we looked at um, a couple of building sites where, uh, in my view, that, that hasn't been given proper consideration, and there's been uh, buildings over, overlooking uh, much smaller buildings or a completely overwhelming much smaller buildings. So it was good to be able to show the minister that in situ and for him to see what that feels like and looks like. Um, we recognise that... Members, would you wish to extend your Deputy Lord Mayor oh, extra no time? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Clary and Deputy Lord Mayor. Back to you. Um, we had a look at um, how recognising how unrestricted height can sometimes lead to a bad outcomes, unintended outcomes. Um, we had a look at um, how catalyst sites sometimes are too big to achieve their stated to the stated goal of increased um, residential growth, and, and um, we to demonstrate that we had we stood we stopped outside the Mayfield and the Ergo site and and looked at at the, um, the development on both sides of the road uh, and made the point, I think, that sometimes smaller scale, lower scale developments actually happen and they happen quickly and they might be a quicker, better way of achieving our, our joint goal of increased residential growth in the city. Um, we talked about um, mechanisms to ensure that demolition of buildings doesn't happen until development is due to begin. That is, people can't come in and clear the site and then sell it on. If they're going to demolish something, then they need to get on and build it themselves. And we don't want um, site clearing uh, with people who aren't intending to proceed. And um, so, as I said, we talked about a number of things. Many of them, uh, and most of them, are included or were already included out in our submission, but we were able to give life to them by living on the street. And so it was a very productive, I think, robust, candid discussion. Um, and we'll be following that up with a letter to the minister drawing his attention to some of the things that we discussed and um, I'll, do, I'll ensure that you will get a copy of that letter um, so that you can see in more detail what we covered. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. We thank you for that motion last year because I echo that it was a very fruitful and productive uh, trip. So. Uh, now, members, there's also a, there's a written report in your papers. Would anyone like to speak to their endeavours since the last council meeting? Uh, in absence of, can I please have someone move the members' reports? Moved by Councillor Clarahan, seconded by Councillor Corbell. I'm going to put that for your vote, members. Those in favour of adopting. 
Thank you, members. Those against, we will carry. Greatly appreciated, members. Thank you. Uh, members, I take you on now to uh, reports for council, which is item 11 in your papers, and we have item 12.1, which is regarding the Mayfair Hotel. There's a recommendation to note and approve. Councillor Corbell, you've got your hand up. Lord Mayor, I need to um, declare a conflict of interest and re um, request to remove myself. What's your reasoning, Councillor? Um, I received some hospitality from the Mayfair Hotel and um, it's been recorded on my members' benefits, but I would not like to participate in this discussion or vote on this matter. That's your decision. Thank you for bringing it to our attention, Councillor Corbell. So, members, we have a recommendation. Oh, sorry, Councillor Antic. Um, Mayor, I'm, I'm, uh, I actually attended a function at uh, the hospitality of the members, uh, so I'm going to do the same, Lord Mayor. That's ultimately your choice, Councillor Antic. I, that's, uh, I, you know, such are the draconian uh, provisions of our um, conflict of interest legislation that I'm not prepared to uh, risk it. Okay, and you don't wish to ask administration any questions to clarify that? Okay. Noted. Thank you, Councillor Antic. Councillor Vershaw, you have a question? Um, Lord Mayor, the, uh, the Mayfair Hotel is a, a sponsor and a partner with the Adelaide Festival, so I need to ask whether that's a conflict of interest. I'll refer that to our CEO if I can, please, Councillor Vershaw. Yeah. Yeah. See, so, yeah, Kylie Bennett might be coming to the microphone to speak to that matter. Through the presiding member, my advice would be that if you're in a sponsorship arrangement for a, an organisation that you're a, an executive or a board member of, then you should declare that conflict and leave the room. Well, then I also need to declare a conflict on the same basis. Members, we lose quorum on this matter, that now means. Let me take uh, procedural advice as to how we proceed. Members, I don't have a quorum on this matter, so we can't proceed. Can I please have a member move to defer? Okay, what I'll do is actually ask the others to come back in the room because I haven't got a quorum to make a decision to defer. What if they don't agree with? They'll have to go out again. Lord Mayor, the problem's further exacerbated because I also think nothing will change because Councillor Wilkinson has also received hospitality and he would declare a conflict of interest. Well, so I'm not quite sure how we manage that. Councillor Abiyad is away. Uh, well, I'm unsure at this point in time whether Councillor Abiyad would actually note a, conf a uh, conflict. So uh, I need a, I can't proceed without a quorum, members, as you can fully appreciate. Sure. Members, there are two ways we could proceed with this. I could look to the floor here. Um, with regards to a motion to defer and then in the hope, members, that we can secure a quorum in which to adequately address the matter or members, a member could move a motion to refer this matter to the CEO to uh, expedite under authority. That is your decision, members. I put it to the floor. I move the committee to be deferred, Lord Mayor. Okay, just, you've got a councillor, uh, sorry, you have a seconder and councillor Clarahan. We've got a motion to defer, members. Councillor um, Moran, you'd like to speak to it? Move an amendment. I'd need to deal with the motion to defer, which effect, in fact is an amendment. No, no, I can, I can move an amendment. That's dealt with first. I move an amendment that this we give delegated authority to the administration. And my reason for that is because what Sue, as Sue said, we will never get. Um, I'm sure Hassan has had hospitality. We won't get a quorum. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. Lord Mayor. Okay. Members, just bear with me. I'm going to take procedural advice, please. Okay, members, I've got to deal with this procedurally. The first thing I have before me is a motion to prefer, so you, uh, defer, so you need to you need to make a vote on that to determine it. So, members, the amendment that you're proposing is a is a direction for the CEO to action, which is in direct contrast to the motion to defer. 
So we have to deal with the aforementioned first, Councillor Moran. So members, any debate about the motion to defer? That's what I'd like to know. Deputy Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I support the motion to defer because um, I, I, I think there is a chance that we might get a quorum. Um, I think that um, Councillor Abiad may will not have a conflict. And I think Councillor Antic might get some advice which would indicate to him that his conflict is something that's manageable or his perceived conflict, conflict is something that is manageable. Um, and because I, I actually have some quite strong views about this and I would like the opportunity to debate it when it comes back. That's correct. But the first part of what the Deputy Lord Mayor said, members, is correct. There may well be a quorum on this matter. So, Lord Mayor, may, may I speak to my motion to defer? Uh, yes, you may. Okay, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, the, the alternative that's been proposed, that is that it's delegated to the CEO, is a decision. And it is a decision that will be taken by a quorum that does not have the capacity to vote because of a perception of a conflict of interest. It is not an option. The only option is the one proposed by uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor that the matter be deferred and that it be considered by a, a properly constituted elected body, not by people who are not entitled to vote. Well, Councillor Martin, with due respect, um, it's not appropriate for you to speak about a matter which has not yet been addressed. It's appropriate for you to speak to your matter, which is a matter to defer. So I was speaking in support of the motion to defer, Lord Mayor. Councillor Clarehan, you seconded the motion to defer. Would you like to speak to it? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just a question. Would it be preferable for this matter to lay on the table? rather than be deferred? Would that be the way of dealing with it until such time as we had a quorum and then it could be re-addressed? All members, can I suggest that you defer it to a defined date, which would be the next council meeting? I'll take a procedural advice. Lord Mayor, I'm happy to bury my original motion to defer until the next council meeting. All right, so Councillor Martin, members, for your information, is now varied to defer to the next council meeting. So this will be back before you within two weeks. Now, we now have a prescribed date. As a seconder, are you happy with that, Councillor Clarehan? Uh, just out of interest, I'd like an answer to my question, Lord Mayor, in relation to it laying on the table. Certainly, Councillor. Judy Speck. To respond, that is certainly one matter that you can do with the item. However, what that will require at the next meeting is a motion to actually lift the matter from the table in the first instance before you consider. The deferral motion gives you a direct date that you will consider the item. The motion at the next meeting to lift could be lost and you would not be able to deal with the matter. Yes, you can. And could I just ask a question, and what if we don't have a quorum because someone is away ill or for other business? What happens then? In the absence of a quorum, you would have the same situation as you would have if the matter was lying on the table. You would still need a motion to lift to consider the matter, and then you would not be able to consider without a quorum. If there is not a quorum at the 14th, the council will need to determine whether or not it defers to the following meeting or delegates authority to the CEO to resolve that. No, no real difference. I'm happy to go with the Okay, so members, we've got a motion to defer from Councillor Martin. Any debate about that, members? Councillor Moran, you'd like to debate that motion? Uh, yes, I would like to. Um, look, I, I think the faint chance that uh, somebody that's already called a conflict then decides not to call a conflict, having decided it's a personal choice, I would say that person still would have a conflict. Um, so therefore we won't get a quorum. Um, I trust that the CEO knows the views of the council and have, we've discussed, um, this has been discussed by council before. Uh, so in this situation I'm confident. Um, just to um, venture on to the foreshadowed, I know it's inappropriate but the previous speaker did, it is entirely appropriate for people that have a conflict to delegate authority to the CEO. There's nothing improper about that because there, as Judy will tell us if she wants to, um, if there's some doubt about that, you're not making a decision, you're asking somebody else to make a decision because you haven't got enough numbers on the floor. So uh, this is not something I'd normally suggest that we do, but in this situation, we're not going to get a quorum. And I think to twist Alex's arm to go and try to get some legal advice to say he has one when he's already said he's got a conflict is, is, not, is not fair. Sandy Wilkinson has a conflict. 
We don't know whether that, that doesn't really matter whether the psalm does or not. We haven't got, we're not getting a quorum. So let's, let's make a decision tonight and let the CEO, who knows the views of council at Ceremonial Street, I, can, I completely trust the administration in this case will make a very good um, decision. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Antic. I just want to clear, Lord Mayor, I, I absolutely think I do not, but such is the onerous and um, uh, draconian nature of the legislation that I'm, it's not a matter I'm prepared to put on the table. So I think that'll be a very common trend for future matters, um, that uh, if there's even the slightest hint of it, um, members should and would take the opportunity to declare a conflict. Um, I don't think I do have one, but I'm not prepared to roll the dice on it. On the matter, um, and uh, and uh, in any event, I mean, I think the legislation works to the effect that if a if, if a conflict is declared, a person can still stay in the chamber anyway to vote. So I think there's a chance we will have a quorum. But um, this is a matter to take up with the attorney general and the state government as to the drafting of the legislation. It's appalling. So um, here we are again. Thank you, Councillor Antic. Councillor Morani, you'd like to speak to the uh, proposed motion to defer. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's always a disappointing day when you spend most of the time on a particular issue talking about conflicts of interest rather than than the issue. And I think that is, um, you know, really disappointing. We've got um, um, business who's trying to do business. Timeliness is important. And uh, here we are talking about conflict of interest. It's really, it's a, it's a really sad day for local government, I think. Um, but. Um, uh, and I respect the decision, by the way, I, I, because of the position that we've been put in. Um, but uh, to take, because of the prickliness of the, the debate around conflict of interest, I think it's time we take this out of our hands and give the CEO the uh, delegated authority to make the decision based on their best advice um, and actually take the decision out of our hands. That's what delegating to the CEO actually does. Um, I think we have an indication based on what that decision will be from a report, but I think it's time to hand that decision over to the CEO and let them get on with it. Members, I've got to exercise my right to speak on this matter also with regards to the uh, proposal to defer. Um, I'm just going to ask a question if I can in the first instance. CEO, is this matter time sensitive? That's three Lord Mayor, no, I don't believe it is. Uh, secondly, uh, look, I echo Councillor Milani's comments with regards to uh, the clunkiness, for want of a better word, of the legislation which is uh, we have to deal with with regards to managing conflicts, perceived, actual or material. Uh, it is very difficult, members, uh, and I'm sure it's very frustrating for members of the community when they're looking to us for a very clear decision. So uh, I would uh, be, uh, should I be voting on this matter, I would uh, uh, be supportive of referring to the CEO so we can have uh, the matter expedited for the sake of business. So. so, members, back to you. Do I have any further comments before I go to a sum up with Councillor Martin? Councillor Martin, to sum up. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I do object to any proposal that this should be a matter for the CEO. That is simply because the CEO's recommendation, his administration's recommendation, is that this should proceed that the proposal by the hotel is worthy of proceeding. Now, I dispute that. I, I have some deep concerns about this matter, and I would like the opportunity to debate them. A proposal that would place this in the hands of the CEO would be a vote in favour. Now, I'd suggest to you that this talk of there not being a capacity to resolve this is premature. Councillor Abiyard is away. When the matter has come to council before, he has never declared a conflict of interest. And I think it unlikely uh, that he will if the matter returns. Now, with his presence, it is my understanding there would then be a quorum. And it would involve necessarily a, a vote from the Lord Mayor, if necessary, uh, to resolve it. But there would be a quorum of elected members. So it's, it's quite uh, uh, premature to be discussing any other resolution of this other than it being deferred. Let me repeat again, a decision to place this in the hands of the CEO is an affirmative decision to proceed and to deny those members who would seek to argue against it an opportunity to at least be heard when there is every possibility of a decision at a later date. And I just ask members to remember that when they vote on this matter. 
Thank you for your sum up, Councillor Martin. So members, we have a motion to defer before you. Those in favour? Sorry, Councillor Corbell, you are just... Can you ask the question? No. You can vote to defer, Councillor Antic, if that's what you're asking. I've taken advice. That is correct. So members, I'll put this back before you. Those in favour to defer? Those against? Okay, motion to defer is carried. So that matter is deferred until two weeks' time. It will be brought back before us. Members, I move you along to item 12.2 uh, on your papers, which is regarding Town Hall Open Day, members. Um, do I have a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Martin is moving. I have Councillor uh, uh, Clarahan who's seconded. Councillor Martin, would you wish to speak to this? Yeah, look, just ever so briefly, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, I, I think uh, uh, we should open the doors to Town Hall as often as possible. Um, it is an important thing to allow the community to come in here and view not only the exquisite furniture and works of art, but the structure itself. I just have uh, uh, one small concern, and that is why it's going to cost so much. I note that we currently also hold an uh, open day uh, at a cost of about $2,000 every May, and yet this proposal is for an open day that will cost seven times as much, some $15,000, including a budget of um, $2,000 for catering and $5,000 for AV staging and entertainment. And I'm just wondering, uh, is this uh, what Councillor Milani would call a blue skies budget? I mean, do we expect it will actually cost this much? Uh, I don't use that language because that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> is that a rhetorical question or a question? Uh, it's a question it is sorry. a question. CEO? Comedy notes, thanks. Through the presiding member, so these were our, our estimates based on our initial um, investigations on the matter, but certainly we would be looking at all ways to minimise the costs in putting on a on an event. Um, there are costs associated in putting on events and making sure that they're um, executed in a way that is appropriate for the, the stature of Town Hall, but we would be looking to minimise that as much as possible. Uh, well, with that assurance, Lord Mayor, I, uh, I feel somewhat relieved. But yes, let me reiterate, I think it is important for us to open Town Hall as often as possible, and perhaps even more than twice a year. And so I, I will support this. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Clarahan, you seconded. Would you wish to speak to it? Oh, only to say I think this is a great idea um, and I like the idea of also involving our various uh, volunteer communities. I think if we do open up the, ta uh, the, the town hall building, we will certainly need to have a lot of areas covered. Hopefully, will we have the carpet laid by then yes. for our new civic areas? Yes. Not that they try and steal the CEO is nodding, nodding, nodding Councillor Clarahan. The CEO is weighing it himself just in time. Timely completion day. And the other thing, uh, Lord Mayor, I was just also wondering whether it would be an appropriate time to uh, request uh, Dr Jeff Nicholson to uh, address interested members of the public on his recent publication wonderful publication of Behind the Streets of Adelaide. It is just a superb piece of research and um, I think uh, it will suit the occasion very well. Very good idea, Councillor Clarahan. <laughs> Members, questions, queries and debate regarding this item 12.2. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to take you back to Councillor Martin. Oh, Councillor Corbell. Councillor Martin, sum up. Sum up okay. Members, for your consideration. Those in favour? Those against, we carry item 12.2. Thank you, members. Members, I take you on to item 12.3. Uh, the regarding, in this matter, item 12 uh, is regarding Rival Park, page 21 of your papers. Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, I've um, circulated an, an alternate motion. Would you like to read that to the Chamber for the benefit of all and sundry, please, DLM? The Council approves consultation to determine how the Rymel Park 
Merlo will refer to a public car park might best be used to facilitate both member and visitor access to the Adelaide Bowling Club and visitor access to Rymel Park. If I could get a second to that, then I'll... Councillor Moran, back to you, DLM. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The, the original motion, um, I wonder if I could just have a look at the original motion, just in case I need to pick up a couple of those. Um, so I, I wonder whether paragraphs two and three, as originally um, included, could also be in my motion. So I'm only, this is just an alternate motion of uh, paragraph one. So I'll take that as a variation. Uh, uh, Councillor Moran, are you happy to include two and three? Yes. Back to you, uh, Deputy Lawman. So the original motion was to uh, go out to consultation to look at how we could facilitate access for the, the members and the users of the bowling club. And I support that. Obviously, I'm very keen that the members and users of the bowling club get access to, their, to the car park associated with their club. But I'm also very keen that uh, the users of the park more generally, Rymel Park, um, which is a family park, um, also have access to that, particularly on Saturdays. So um, the members were, of, the, of the bowling club were looking at exclusive access on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And, um, and I think there needs to be perhaps a bit more balance. It may well be that when the, um, the administration have done their consultation, they come back to us and recommend, yes, indeed, that's what the bowling club gets. But I suspect um, that once I've had a, uh, had a bit of a further look at it and expanded the horizons a bit and had a look at what other people are using that car park and why they're using it, um, then they may come up with some other mechanisms so that users of the park, particularly people with young children using the playground, also get to access the park. In looking at this and in consulting on this, what I'm trying to do is facilitate access to the, um, to the bowling club and access to the park and to be really honest, I'm trying to disadvantage those people who park in that car park and walk through the city to do their shopping, and those people who can't park in that car park and walk across the road to the Credible Terrace offices and go to work. And I, I know that car park is used for other purposes. People see it as a cheap, <laughs> well, a, a secret, a number of people refer to me as a secret car park that they use when they go and do their, um, when they access the city. I'd like those people to take their cars into the city, use the city car parks, if that's what they're for. Um, so I'm particularly looking at, at advantaging parklands users and disadvantaging those people who are not using the parklands. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I've got Councillor Corbell followed by Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Corbell. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I will support this, but just I wanted to point out that the administration recommendation that came through to APFA was actually that we allocate parking to the bowling club on Wednesdays and Saturdays exclusively. And after um, a quite a lengthy discussion at the APFA meeting, we, we changed it so that we go to consultation on that and do it as a trial. So we're bringing it right back. Um, so I do support this, but I wouldn't be surprised if, the, based on the original recommendation of the administration, if it comes back that the recommendation is that we um, we just give them the exclusive access, keeping in mind that our current parking policy is from 2001 and will be included as part of a review. And this is this if we give them exclusive access is something new and doesn't exist in our current policy framework for parking. Thank you, Councillor Cobell. Uh, Councillor Clarence, if you don't mind, I might just hand to Councillor Moran, because Councillor Moran seconded and I didn't customarily ask. Councillor Moran, would you like to speak to this before Councillor Clarence? Mm, yes. Um, Councillor Cobell um, very, uh, summed up very well what um, APLA um, thought of the exclusive use just straight away without consultation or a trial period. And I'm very glad that Councillor Hinder has removed the trial period. I think the proper steps, is to, steps are to um, consult first, and then if there's any support in, in doing this, then we can have a trial period for the bowling time. I'm quite flagged that I'm quite against them having the exclusive use. Um, it would be the first and only car park that has this in the park plans. And the car our parking policy, even though it's old, um, still is quite clear that the park, car parks and the park lands are for the park land users, of which some are the bowling club. Um, but um, they also, the people that use the, the parks around there um, with their children often use that car park as well. I'm not so sure. I also agree that the workers um, and shoppers, mainly the workers, should be um, discouraged. But I think there's a time car park, mm -hmm. so I don't think they can park there anyway. Um, I'm not so sure about 
about putting off shoppers, but uh, still. But I think this is the right way, um, cautiously move forward. Um, I was disappointed that the staff recommendation was so um, keen to get, give exclusive rights, but I'm sure that the administration will let go of that initial recommendation and um, consult with an open mind. I'm hoping that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Councillor Clarehan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I think this um, proposal by Count the Deputy Lord Hender is fine. Uh, my initial re response to, um, to this motion was that it was a good idea. It is absolutely absurd that people who play a particular um, sport associated with a club cannot find a car park so that nearby um, so that they can participate in that in those clubs activities and I know that there are a number of people from North Adelaide who are members of the club who are in their 80s and they're finding it very very taxing to actually have to cross that six lane highway to be able to participate in club activities and play and play bowls on a Wednesday. I'm not sure whether they play them on a Saturday, and for that reason, I'm very happy uh, for this motion, this amended motion, um, to stand uh, because I think we can find out exactly who is impacted and how often. And I would probably like to think that we would be able to do some observations in terms or surveys in terms of the users of that car park because if it's being used by people on the other side of um, Kettable Terrace uh, who work there, if it's being used by people to go in um, to the city for lunch or to shop, I think that really defeats the intent of having the car park there. One would acknowledge that you know it's it's uh, vital for people to be able to access the playground in Rymel Park, although there is quite a bit of other parking available for them. But as this motion stands, I'm very happy. Hopefully, we'll come back with a bit more detailed information on which to base the decision. But certainly, we need to support those people who are actually using the parkland facilities. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Slammer. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll just add to that um, result of the Oban um, development, recent Oban development. They understand an extra 50 car parks being generated on the uh, east terrace side of the parklands. So those I'm hoping would be would be beneficial for those that are visiting the Rundle Mall and the Rundle Street precincts. But certainly in light of an event only last week of an elderly gentleman crossing the Quetable Terrace and got skittled at 60 k's an hour. It's a fast road, and I think, you know, I'm not saying that all the uh, grandparents of ours are the only people that attend the bowling grounds, but there are a large number of older people. I think we should, we should take consideration for, for, to provide a means of problem. Absolutely. Thank you, members. So, of course, we're debating an alternate motion put forward by the DLM. Is there any further debate before I hand back to the DLM? Members, before I do, uh, I, I do hope that when this does come back to us, uh, one, that we can affect change for the bowling season for this year, uh, which of course I understand starts in October, so it would be a crying shame for us to miss another year, so I think we may need to make a decision on this once the consultation comes back. And secondly, I hope, members, that we are in a position where we are providing some support to this group. Um, uh, you know, bowling gear uh, is not light. And uh, I think it does uh, deserve some special consideration, being that it is uh, two days a week for six months of the year only, and uh, for the balance of that, of course, this car, car this car park can be used by others. So I don't think it's too unreasonable. DLM, uh, back to you to sum up. Members, those in favour of the alternate motion as you have before you. Those against, we carry the alternate motion. Thank you, members. Members, I take you to item uh, 12.4, uh, which we have a uh, encroachment matter to endorse. So do I have a mover, please, members? Councillor Slama, seconded by Councillor Maloney. Councillor Slama, do you wish to speak to this matter? Yeah, I might, Lord Mayor, absolutely. Um, look, I'll, I'll, I'll support it as it stands. Um, Understanding that um, the policy, uh, we've set a precedent with other developments in the area at the moment, and especially where this particular development is, it, it's not Boulevard facing, Main Street facing. 
Um, it would be reasonably foolish, I think, to start enforcing um, the new or up and coming changes to what, you know, in terms of charging and all, all, all the stuff that we're proposing onto this existing development. So I'm happy to listen to the, uh, the arguments on the floor, but I'm quite supportive of uh, proceeding as, as recommended. Thank you, councillors. Notwithstanding, councillors, of course, uh, you did have a, a workshop committee meeting with regard to this matter uh, within the last week, and at this point in time, of course, there are no decisions regarding forward policy, but there is debate regarding the forward policy. Um, it was seconded by Councillor Maloney. Councillor Maloney, would you wish to speak to this? Preserve my right. Preserving your right. Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, I just want to ask a question first of administration. Um, uh, is there a mechanism where if we were to grant this encroachment and then uh, adopt a policy that applied a fee to residential encroachments, that we could apply that fee to this development? Does that make sense? See you. Shanti, do thanks. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, um, it is possible for Council to apply a retrospective uh, fee arrangement. Um, that would be entirely up to Council to make that decision. And I mean, given that we've had discussions about this and given the clear intent of our discussions is that we're amending, that we're going to amend our policy and I think it's pretty clear from the discussions that we intend to amend our policy to start to apply it. Um, to a residential, a cost to residential components. Uh, would we, could you help with them with an amendment that would enable that, or is it something that could be taken on notice? Or how would I best approach that? Through the Lord Mayor, uh, the recommendation is based on the current policy, so it's actually rather difficult to um, speculate what the new policy might say. Um, however. Uh, so just to answer that, simply that if the new policy applies a fee to encroachments, that that fee applies to this property. Particularly given that this building won't be built before our policy changed. So, you know, we that's, we've already been told that can happen, so we don't have to sign that now. Through Lord Mayor, if I could just make a comment. I just think it's important on this particular matter for Council to be fully informed and there is a fair bit of modelling and clarity required I think to, to provide an adequate answer to you. I think it's an important question to try to apply a fee retrospectively I think is, is, is an important issue to be dealing with so um, perhaps caution would be the way to go tonight with that. Okay, on the basis of that advice, I'll support it as it, as it currently stands. Um, I do think we need to get then to get on with our encroachment policy as quickly as possible, and I then I think we need to send a very, very clear message to our development uh, community that we've drawn a line in the sand and from here on in. It would be lovely if we could if we could have started to apply it now, take the advice that we can't. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, members, Councillor Martin, you reserved your right. Members, any further debate on this matter? Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, thank you, Lord Mayor. The, the point that Councillor Hinder uh, raises is uh, a reasonable point. Uh, I think there is stomach among some elected members uh, to review the policy with regard to not charging for encroachments and to begin the process of charging. And I think this is a good opportunity to put developers on notice that this will be debated within this council by members who feel strongly about it. I regret very much uh, because of bereavement that Councillor Wilkinson isn't here this evening. Uh, he is able to articulate on this subject much more clearly than I am. 
But the point that he made earlier this afternoon in uh, a note to all members uh, was simply that uh, we should um, recognise that developers are familiar with the sites that they purchase at the time they purchase. And so it is up to them to determine whether or not they can construct a development that uh, provides the return to them on the space available without encroaching on public land. And I draw everybody's attention to the administration's comments at 13.10. And that is that this in, uh, encroachment proposed offers limited benefits to the public. Uh, that is to say, there's nothing in it for our ratepayers except that the de development will proceed on the basis that the developer has calculated this into the project. So let's revisit that and let's remind developers that it is public land over which they are building and though that uh, uh, might be allowed, it will come at a cost at some stage. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Would you like a question or would you like to debate, Councillor Malani? Councillor Slama moved. Yeah, you seconded, Councillor. Um, yeah, look, I um, take a slightly contrary view to the sentence that Councillor Martin just delivered in terms of no public benefit. Because the public benefit here is that we get um, increased rates, we get increased population, we get um, investment in, in our city. Um, and I think that needs to be recognised as public benefit. That is benefit to everyone in the city. So I think it's a little bit blasé to say that there is zero um, public benefit and um, even picking up the words from the report. So um, I think um, uh, we should acknowledge that this is, you know, a positive, um, progressive investment into the city. Thank you. Members, I don't see any further hands. So before I hand back to Councillor Slama, uh, just listening to that debate, members, I think it's always a little, uh, we need to be a little cautious about speculating about a future position of council on which we have not made a decision yet. So it would seem that that debate has found its level in this chamber this evening, but I would just be a little cautious, members, in the future should we have a similar set of circumstances about speculating about something which we may decide at a future time. Because I'm sure members, as I would, as I know you would, you would want to be fully informed about the consequences, intended or otherwise, about any decision you make. So with that note, I'll hand back to Councillor Slaughter. A good summary for me, Lord Mayor, thank you. Um, summed up. Uh, members, those in favour? Those against? Motion carried. Thank you, members. Uh, members, I will take you on to item 15.5, which could be best described, my mistake, 12.5, I'm reading backwards, I apologise, members. Uh, members, item 12.5, which is a similar but different matter. Do I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Moran. I have seconded by Councillor Malani. Councillor Moran, would you wish to speak to it? Uh, no. Councillor Malani, would you wish to speak to item 12.5? Reserving a right. Reserving a right. Members, any debate regarding item 12.5? Councillor Malani, coming back to you, because we're going to sum up by the look of it. No, so you're reserving your right, you're not speaking. I'm going back to the mover. Summed up. Summed up. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Members, those in favour, item 12.5. Those against 12.5, we carry 12.5. Thank you very much, members. Uh, members, I now take you to uh, item 12.6 on your agendas. Uh, noting, members, before I do, uh, that you have a uh, recommendation before you, members. Sorry, yes, I mistake. Members, you do have it. Councillor Martin, I have seconded by Councillor Malani. Councillor Martin, floor is yours for item 12.6. Six. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I want to generally uh, speak in support of this, um, though I would have preferred this was part of a uh, competitive process as part of the Parklands Leasing and Licensing Policy. I accept that it was in train in the fashion before that policy came in. Um, that said, uh, the proponents and the administration have, uh, have come good with a, uh, an excellent compromise, no increase in footprint, and an undercroft design proposed by Councillor Wilkinson, I recall, at APLA, 
uh, that allows more than doubling the current floor space for the clubs. It's a good outcome for design and it's a good outcome for the parklands. I, I do, however, want to draw attention to two matters um, which will come to us at a later time, and that is the license and lease and the car parking. Now, it is the policy of the administration, I understand, to provide leases in circumstances like this of not more than 21 years. And it would be my expectation, my hope, that the policy is followed in this case. 42 years is a very, very long time, Lord Mayor, and, and by 2067, 2067, 42 years would be, um, who knows if we'll be playing soccer. We might all be playing Quidditch by then. So 42 years is much too long. 21 years is about right in my view. And the second point is that I know the sum of $30,000 of ratepayer funds, that is council funds, not the proponents funds, are going into a study of infrastructure support including plans for car parking. Uh, those plans, I'm told, will be brought back to council, but I'd like the administration to take on board that there's really no good reason to increase the footprint of the current car park in my submission. Uh, I know there's pressure from players and the club uh, to deal with what is inadequate street parking. There have been numerous occasions when club members have complained about parking tickets, but uh, the solution is not to be found on the parklands in my view. It is a, a much more holistic solution that is required in this case, and possibly we should be examining ways in which we can capitalise on street parking uh, with solutions that might be as simple as, as angle parking rather than parallel parking or, or even providing a shuttle if that's possible but the solution does not have to come from the parklands they are parklands not car parklands thank you councillor martin i'm sure that administration have uh, duly noted your comments <laughs> <laughs> councillor Malati, you seconded would you wish to speak to this matter um, look, yeah, I wasn't going to, but I just um, I, I fully endorse this. I think this is um, a great project, um, and I always have. Um, I guess one of the learnings I'd just like to take um, reflect on a learning um, fr from this, which I think is is important for everyone. Um, this uh, organisation came to uh, council and 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 discussed. Um, this uh, opportunity to upgrade these facilities. They were given some advice. They, came, they went away, they invested in architects and they got plans developed. And they came back and the administration said, yes, great, now let's take it to council, where council poo-pooed it. There is a learning to be taken from this about the disconnect between the conversation about the advice we're giving to those that are trying to do good things and how we get them to invest their money wisely into designs and plans, etc. And this is not just one club that's had to face this challenge, but let's learn from this process because I don't want it to happen again. It's not fair to those community clubs that have limited budgets um, and time. They're all volunteers. And I, I really think that we put these people through the absolute ringer when they're trying to do something good. I'm glad we've landed here. But I, I hold us a little bit accountable for that in our process. So I think we need to take a lesson from this and not let that happen again in this chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Malani. I look to the floor members. Is there any further debate on this matter? Otherwise, I hand back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Members, the matter is summed up, so I put it for your consideration. Those in favour? Those against? We carry item 12.6, uh, members, thank you. Members, that takes us directly on to item 12.7, uh, which is a report to note, members. So do I have a mover? Councillor Moran is moving. It's seconded by Councillor Clarehan, who had that hand up straight away. Councillor Moran, would you wish to speak to this report to note? Yes, look, I shouldn't really because it's to note, but obviously um, it's probably time that church, we looked at Chinatown again. We probably did the worst um, job at paving it last time. Um, we used very expensive Victoria Square pavers, um, but I, I'm not sure who put them, who we employed to put them down, but it really is looking tired and it needs to be looked at again, especially with the um, big injection of of um, funding that the old, as we always call it, the old food hall is getting. 
um, now, so I think it's time to to start planning another smart up, smart up. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Councillor Clarehan, followed by Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Clarehan. Reserving your right, Deputy Lord Mayor. We can't support this, but I do just want to make a couple of comments um, about some of the things I think we need to take into account when we're refurbishing, if that's the right word, um, uh, Chinatown. One of them is that Chinatown was developed at a time when we were wanting to put a focus and a showcase on Chinese culture because there wasn't a whole lot of other culture around that area. I think the area has completely changed as a consequence, and I often see tourists down there with their map looking at what they think is Chinatown and looking down Marinta Street and thinking, you're kidding me, we've come here for this, when actually the reaction is actually out on, on Goodyear Street. So I think we need to be thinking about this, not just in terms of Moonta Street, and because and often when we think about Chinatown, we're really just thinking about Moonta Street. We need to be thinking about it as a holistic area um, and, and particularly looking at ways where we can involve Goodyear Street and Grove Street in the activities and to try and get a sort of a larger outcome um, for this area. Um, I think um, there is also a, a huge opportunity to show, showcase Chinese history and culture. There's nothing sort of apparent in the area that relates to the history, and we know the Chinese, the Chinese community has made a big contribution to South Australian history, and I think whatever work we do there ought to somehow reflect that history and also the contemporary culture of, of, of Chinatown. Uh, I think there's some work to be done with signage. I don't know whether that's our work or, or the, the um, landlord's work, but the signage is pretty ugly, and I think there's, we can improve that. I think traffic management needs to be addressed, um, parking management particularly. Often the, uh, what is it, the Goodyear Street end, what's at the southern end of, of Moonta Street, is used as a car park um, for long periods of time, even on, on those times when you would expect it to be being um, throbbing with, with um, people eating. I think um, rubbish management needs to be addressed and I have to say I think some of the businesses around there need to take some responsibility for that um, because again, Thursday nights have, appears to be rubbish night. To me, Thursday night ought to be eating night or at least one of the big eating nights. And so a lot of rubbish is out on the street on Thursday night. Greening needs to be addressed. Um, I think there's a big opportunity for greening in that area, either trees or perhaps it's something that where, where vines might work to try and get some, um, some green into that area. I think City of Music considerations need to be addressed. Um, there, there are sometimes a few buskers in the area, but I think that could be really enhanced and improved. Um, I think the event space needs to be addressed. Uh, it's uh, the Chinatown run an event every year and it's in very tight and constrained circumstances and actually becomes very hard for anybody else to access the space at the very time when you would want other people to be accessing the space, that is Lunar New Year. Uh, I think outdoor dining needs to be addressed. I made some inquiries of our administration. There are a few tables down at, at the Great Street end, there are a few other tables scattered around. There's actually nothing precluding the people who have businesses around there applying for outdoor dining free, as it currently is, hopefully not forever, but free outdoor dining, and running tables right down the middle of Moonta Street, bollard to bollard. Um, so I would like us to be um, in, I'm very keen that we do this work, but I think it's, it's more than putting down pavers. I think it's actually about really addressing um, the whole street and what we can do to really enhance that area and make it a, a really precious component of our city. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Members, any further debate? Councillor Clare, you reserved your right. Would you like to speak now? Just, I just wanted a bit of clarification, Lord Mayor. I thought I read that our pavers would actually last for another 10 to 15 years. Could we have some clarification on that? Certainly, Councillor. Because I suspect if we start on that paving, there won't be much money left for anything else, given what it cost last time. And Matt Grant, thanks. Through you, Lord Mayor, um, the life expectancy of the existing pavers is 2032. Thank you. Councillor Slama, does that satisfy your question, Councillor Clarehan? Uh, you'd still have an uh, ability to debate later, should you wish, Councillor Clarehan. That was just a question. Uh, Councillor Slama, followed by Councillor Mulaney. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And uh, further on to Councillor, Deputy Lord Mayor's um, comments, I also want to make a comment in relation to the um, Chinatown Reinvigoration Advisory Group that uh, I read about in this report. I think that's a great move. I'd like the administration to note that to take, take on an approach of partnership with the property owners in the area. 
um, understanding that since 89, some of those property owners probably haven't touched their buildings. And if, if we were to proceed down a, down a beautification and an investment into Chinatown, I'd love it to be a partnership with the property owners. The last thing we want is beautiful streets with pretty average buildings. And so, so that partnership is critical. And it may be an opportunity to use the example of maybe the East End. Um, the, the two developers down there have, have worked in partnership with councils. We've got beautiful buildings, beautiful greens. They're, 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 uh, um, the developers down there have got daily cleaners that they pay from, from their own maintenance pockets to, to get rid of graffiti and clean the place up, get rid of chewing gum off the buildings. And then, of course, when they do that, council's investment is, is, is merely just um, uh, makes it all look good. It all works together. So I just have to ask administration to work with the property owners and, and make this a partnership rather than just us going in, investing money into something that the, uh, the stakeholders aren't uh, co-invested in. Thank you, Councillor Slama. Councillor Maloney? Mm -hmm. Members, any further debate? Before I hand back to Councillor Moran, I must say, Deputy Lord Mayor, your comments regarding an inclusion of something about the cultural reference around the history of uh, Chinese migration into uh, South Australia uh, is a very good point. Uh, Councillor Moran, to sum up. Members, to vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry that item. Thank you very much, Members. Members, I go to item uh, 12.8, members, noting that this is to note, to support, to approve and to request. There are four separate parts to this. Councillor Maloney is moving. It's seconded by Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Maloney, do you wish to speak to the Peel Street matter? Yeah, I took my words out of my mouth, uh, Lord Mayor. I support this. I'm always uh, never that excited to support uh, results, noting results of consultation to go and do more consultation. Uh, but I understand the legislative, it's a legislative requirement, so uh, let's, let's go. Interestingly, I coincidentally was chatting to a business on Hill Street today um, who was quite excited at the prospect that this street was going to be closed, so, um, so uh, that, that was good to hear. They're very much in support. One of the things that was pointed out to me whilst I was there is um, it's, it's a bitumen road, but there's sort of lines of, of paving um, through the um, through the road, and they're all cracking. And it's probably because there's you know some cars going through. So one of the feedback I instantly got today was we can't wait for it to be closed. But there's a lot of paving that needs to, some repair on that. So I just sort of bring it to the um, attention that when we um, uh, obviously not having cars go through there will help that problem. But there is a bit of a problem there now with that. Uh, but I think it's if you're going to close a street, this is the first one to to uh, focus on, and I hope it sets more precedents in the future. Thank you, Councillor Maloney. Councillor Clarehan, as a seconder. Mm -hmm. um, just a question first: How long uh, will the consultation take, and uh, the matter being brought back to council? We've got some idea. Are we talking about two months? I understand it's four weeks. Oh, is that all? Okay. Um, look, I just I think this is a great a great recommendation. Uh, I hope that the consultation uh, comes back with the results that most people would be in agreement. I'm sure there will be some minor issues that need to be managed in terms of deliveries. Uh, and that may be reflected in the design of the street a la Lee Street where there's an indentation or whatever. But um, just walking down there in the evenings, late afternoon, it's certainly a place that's full of people and I think uh, an opportunity to make it even more uh, user-friendlier in terms of pedestrians and outdoor dining, etc., is a fabulous idea. So I totally support um, the notion and I do hope the consultation uh, further supports that. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Deputy Lord Mayor, I think you had your hand up, then I'll go to Councillor Slammer after you. Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, look, I'm, I'm also willing to support this, but I do have one, one concern, and that is that um, with this um, road closed, the, uh, the access from the west um, means that the only opportunity you have to turn left is you can't turn left into Rosetta, you can't turn left into Lee Street, you can't turn left into Peel Street if this is closed, and then and you can't turn left into Guild Place. 
It means that there's a very, very, very long period, a place there where you can't turn left. And we have a number of buildings, uh, businesses on Hiney Street. So I've spoken to the administration and I've got a, um, uh, an undertaking, or well, I'd like an undertaking, I guess, that, that the consultation um, uh, looks at traffic flows more generally in that area and looks at um, and, and involves consultation with businesses, particularly on Hindley Street, for some of whom that might be the only access through. Uh, I understand that the people on the street have overwhelmingly said they want the street closed. So would I if I lived on the street but, or had a business on the street. But they're not the only people who would be impacted by this closure. So with that undertaking, that, that, that the consultation will be broad and that we'll take account of other businesses and traffic flow more generally, um, then I'm very happy for the consultation to go ahead. Thank you. Um, that's duly noted by our director, Beth. Yep. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Slama, followed by Councillor Antic. Councillor Slama. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Just a quick question, Administration. I'll read in the report in relation to traders and businesses. Are there any property owners that are involved or will be affected, and um, are we working with them? CEO? Yes, yeah, through Lord Mayor, we will work, we will work with the property owners as well. Councillor Antic. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, I'm, I'm planning to support this as well. This is a, a reasonable proposal for this street, but my understanding is that it's not quite as universal as it may be um, uh, perceived here. There may well be some businesses uh, in Peel Street that are not uh, ecstatically happy about this, but are happy to go with the flow. So I'd just like that to be taken uh, into consideration. Um, the other observation is, of course, that as I said, this is a, a unique street and it is one that has worked very well and it seems logical to at least try down there, but I would hate to think um, if this would become precedent for streets to be closed willy nilly, random here, there, and everywhere, because that's certainly not going to be uh, the case. Uh, it's about what's wrong, Sue. So, yeah. I'll just look at you. Oh, that's right. Right. Oh, it's, but it's amusing for you. Um, but um, but uh, in any event, I'll have to, I'd like to entertain nonetheless. Members, yeah. please. Councillor Antic is speaking. Whatever gracious we can. Um, but uh, in any event, um, uh, of course, it is. Uh, it is. Uh, will be. If you, Pertinent to, just to point out that this would not be a slippery slope approach, uh, and that you know future road closures, uh, closures uh, should be taken the, um, I suppose the, uh, uh, with uh, a degree of caution, I guess, because we uh, the deputy lord mayor makes a very good point. These these are still streets uh, where people rely on access and deliveries and through access and that sort of stuff. So I'm happy to support this, but I just want to make it clear that. We would hate to see this being anything other than the exception rather than the rule. So, is that all right, sir? Yeah, good. Just check. So, we just check. Members, do we have any further debate? Thank you, Councillor Antic. No further debate. I'm going to hand back to the mover, Councillor Mulani. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Yes, uh, look, I, um, I endorse this. I've seen a lot of so many near misses in that street when cars are going through and there's patrons standing um, and sitting by uh, the, the businesses that are there. I, I'm quite confident that it's really not the businesses on Pineley Street that are using it as a thoroughfare. It's more those that want to find that one park that's on that street. And then it's almost like the cruising down, sort of, you know, checking out the crowds kind of drive through. So um, I don't think um, it's really going to impact the businesses too much on Hindley Street. Um, but um, uh, yes, we'll get the consultation back. It says here May, May, so let's get on with it. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Milani. Uh, members, all in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, councillors. I now take you to item 12.9. Councillor Antic had hand up first. Councillor Antic. Moving is printed, seconded by Councillor Vershaw, is that correct? Yes, Councillor Antic. We've got a conflict. Have we done this Okay. Members, I look to you. Thank you. Do you want us to talk to us? Yes, please, I want you to talk. Councillor Mulaney. Advice uh, uh, dictates that we um, should uh, consider that, as a DAP member, we should consider this item and declare a conflict of interest, which uh, I'm sure I'll just talk on behalf of my other fellow DAP members here that we'll do now and leave the Chamber. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Mulaney. Councillor Moran, do you echo that sentiment? Yes. Councillor Slama, do you echo that sentiment? Yes. Thank you, members. Thank you for bringing that attention to your fellow members. Members, we have a quorum, so I put this matter before Councillor Antic, who moved. Councillor Antic, floor is yours. Thank you. Our second was Councillor Vershaw. Members, is there any debate on this matter? Councillor Antic, I'll go back to you. Summed up. Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry. If we could bring our fellow members back into the chamber. Okay, members, thank you. Welcome back. We are one member down as count. Okay. Councillor Vershaw, thank you. Julie noted that you needed to leave early. Thank you very much. Members, I have a quorum, so I will proceed in this instance. So uh, we have a recommendation before us. Councillor Morani, are you moving? Well, Mayor, um, I might move with an amendment. I have a question, if I just to get clarity, if I may. Certainly, if you could lead with the question. Thanks, Councillor Um Looking at attachment A, it includes the CEO's office and the Lord Mayor's office. Um, and I'm assuming that is for new carpet to be included in as part of this plan. Um, the carpet was replaced in both of those offices in the last three years. Am I correct on that? Is it, was it, is it within the last three years? CEO. Helen, thanks. Through the Lord Mayor, uh, my understanding it has been within the last five years. It, it's, yes, it's well within the last five years, I'd say. And my second question is, are all these different, um, uh, I'll, I'll move, but I'm going to have an amendment, Lord Mayor, that I'm removing the Lord Mayor's office and the CEO from this plan for the time being. Well, Council, would you like that to be a, uh, an alternate motion that might be well, easier I'm, to I'm, assist you? I'm just putting that as a, I'll put it as a, uh, I'll, just, I'll just add something just to give you clarity. Um, in the, the first point, Approves the Adelaide Town Hall Civic Areas Carpet Plan shown in attachment A, minus CEO's office and Lord Mayor's office, and then I'll add a third point that says that can come back for future consideration. And I and I um, believe that that carpet's just been done not that long ago. Lord Mayor, I think you agree. But um, that's my that's what I'm moving. Okay, I've got a second to Councillor Moran, so back to you for the debate, Councillor Maloney. Um, look, now I recall when I uh, stood at the junction just out here that at one point in um, when we first got elected, I was elected in 2010, I could see seven carpets within the, the whole radius of, you know, like this. So I, I take the point that we need to upgrade and, and discarpet in the chamber and the civic areas where actually people are going to, uh, we, we take pride in our town hall. And I think the work that's been done has been great, but I categorically recall very recently that we've done the carpet in the back, the back office here in the CEO's and the Lord Mayor's office, very nice carpet you've got Lord Mayor. Um, and I can actually think of more places in the town hall that need carpet way before those two offices. Um, I um, And I, I don't think that, you know, we can reprioritise, we can bring it back, we can have the conversation after the other civic areas have been completed because they are the priority as far as I'm concerned. The areas that where we do bring in public, we do bring in um, visitors, guests, and uh, it's important for us to maintain this, this uh, town hall. Um, I'm not the expert in choosing the carpet. I'm more than happy for the experts to do that, and there have been some good expertise. My, I still question personally that these are all different, they all look different, at least they look same, same, but different. 
Um, I'll be guided by the expertise on that, but all I can say is, is it's quality, it's tasteful, it integrates, it's connected to the work we've already done up in the, um, the town hall, which I think has been excellent, looks fantastic. Um, but I'm just trying to prioritise here. We're conscious of how we spend our ratepayers' money, and I think that uh, those two rooms and areas are not a priority. How are you with that, CEO? Uh, we have a second to Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak to this matter? I'll reserve my right. Thank you. We've got Councillor Farahan, followed by the Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Farahan. Um, could I just ask a question of administration and um, the people involved in this project? If, if these two rooms are not done now in terms of carpet manufacturing, is there any danger that we may not be able to get the same colour lots or any, is there any issue around not uh, including the CEO's office and the Lord Mayor's office in this whole suite of designs? Thanks. Through the Lord Mayor, uh, no, there is no risk. The carpet contractor will have these designs on file for future use in and, and essentially it would be for as long as we would like to keep it on file with the company. So there is no risk. And another question is, um, I'm trying to think of the carpet in the CEO's office and I can't remember it. Will it clash with the scheme, with the rest of the scheme? Yes, it will. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Is it possible to actually, um, if that carpet is not very old, is it possible that it could be used elsewhere, uh, in the either in the civic areas or in our administrative areas? Through the Lord Mayor, there's a potential use for it in the CLC building. It's a tufted carpet. It's the only carpet in the town hall that's not an Axminster carpet. Um, so there may be an opportunity to reuse it elsewhere in office buildings, but I wouldn't suggest we reuse it in the town hall. It's just not in keeping with the quality of what we're looking for. So, um, Lord Mayor, this, is, this has been a very, very, um, I, I suppose, rigorous exercise in terms of planning, design, based on lots of research and the participation of many experts. Um, and I think it would be remiss, given that the CEO's office and the Lord Mayor's office um, are very public places in terms of lots of members of public coming in for meetings, etc. cetera, um, we don't need to miss this opportunity to have um, a continuous design uh, running throughout or a suite of designs running throughout all the civic centres. It may appear to be uh, lavish, but I think in this instance, if that carpet can be used elsewhere, and I hear that it probably can, well then I think we should take this opportunity um, to complete the exercise that we embarked upon. And I think it was um, started by um, Councillor Milani's comment about how um, uncoordinated the whole civic area was. And I think to, to leave those two officers out uh, on this occasion, I think would be remiss. I think if we're going to do it, let's do it properly and let's reuse the carpet that has been recently laid elsewhere uh, in the CLC building. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I'm lucky enough to sit on the Civic Recognition Working Group, so I've had a look at some of these plans beforehand and also been privy to, to some discussions which have been very similar to the discussion that Councillor Malani put, which is about making sure that where we do do this work, we do it uh, in a way to maximise the places where the public goes. And, um, and the report doesn't actually talk to the priority order, um, but I'm wondering whether Councillor Malani would consider um, a variation to her motion, which just leaves the prioritising, prioritising somehow to, to others, 
or even indicates the priority and still approves the entire plan. Because for me, part of it is actually for us to say, yep, this is what we want to do. It's not about saying we don't want to do it in the Lord Mayor's office or in the, in the, um, uh, the CEO, CEO's office. It's just about saying the, the order of priority in which we ought to do it. For me, the priority, uh, and this is what was discussed at the working group, the priority the, is the corridor down, the one that everyone walks down every time they come in, into the, the Colonel Light Room where everybody spends time. You know, it's, it's about making sure that we uh, we spend it in the public spaces first, and then we work out where it goes after that. So I'm wondering whether Councillor Mulani would consider making a, a, a variation to a document somehow. Don't know how. I'm open to that so take your point. What I'm trying to avoid is every time we get a CEO and a Lord Mayor they change the carpet. So, um, you know, it's like a carpet fest. So, um, I'm open to... Um, we could just take out, could I make a Sure. If you took out the, the parts that are marked in red as amendments with and just said with priority access, with priority being given to public areas and taking account of um, recent refurbishments or something like that. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. My yeah. second there is. No, I no. think it has to be clear, so you have to find another second. Uh, well, I'll take, oh, can I, yeah, we'll, we'll work this together with priority given to public areas and recent refurbishments. Sorry, Councillor Money, this will need to come from the Deputy Lord Mayor who's no, suggesting very, the variation, but Councillor Money didn't just agree. I'm going to ask if, she, if she'll accept this variation. And Rizbet, comma, um, leading the C CEO office and Lord Mayor's office in attachment A um, to the last. <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy with that. I think we would prioritise public that the Lord Mayor and the CEO's office be last to be done as they were the most recent to be carpeted. And to be refurbished last. Yeah. Um, I'm happy with that. Okay, and, so I look to administration. And never change for that. another 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> This should be a damn good carpet. It should last the testament of time. We shouldn't be replacing carpet every five years. Like I said, the last Lord Mayor and CEO changed carpet. Are you happy with that variation? Is that okay. So the motion is now varied. It's on your screen. It's given to on your screen and in front of you. Public uh, areas and recent refurbishments, leaving the CEO and Lord Mayor's office in the attachment A to be refurbished last. Okay. I'm trying to get a win-win here. Definitely, Lord, Lord Mayor, that fulfils your wishes. Um, Members, you've taken comfort with that. Get my wishes, but if I was if it was totally my way, I'd say don't refurbish them at all. But I'm happy to get them. Okay. I now look to Councillor Slama. Now I look to Councillor Corbell on this matter. Councillor Slama. So the question is last. Does that mean we do everything on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then within the Lord Mayor's office on Friday? Please know them, yeah. <laughs> or or is this, when's the last? The question to the administration, when would last be? Is this like two years down the track, or is it at the end of the week when we start on Monday on the other one? Through the Lord Mayor, subject to funding approval for next year, the, the, the carpets across the civic areas will be delivered by the end of next year's financial year. So the intention is that we deliver the carpet renewal across the civic areas this financial year and next financial year. Right, that's good. Now, look, I'll be happy with that. And I'll just make a comment that I'm pretty sure we can sell the Lord Mayor's carpet on eBay, Gumtree, um, at a charity auction. There'd be plenty of people that would bid for the Lord Mayor's carpet. And I'm sure with the export of the China, you could possibly sell your Lord Mayor at the same time, Councillor Slama. <laughs> Can I move it? Uh, thank you, Councillor Slama. Uh, Councillor Corbell. Lord Mayor, I just have a question. With the carpet that's in here in the Council Chamber, when was that last laid? It's been See you. Long ago. Through, through the Lord Mayor, 1970s. So, so this carpet that's in here is from the 1970s? Correct. I think it's still in, like, I think it's in okay. <laughs> and that, that's because it's an Axminster carpet. The quality is the same, that we'll be replacing it with. Okay, well, I'm very happy with the selection. And again, I'm not an expert, but 
Um, I completely agree with all of this, like roll it out in the, the public areas first and then do the CEOs and all mayor's offices last. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Councillor Mann, you reserved your right. Do you like to speak now? Yes, look, I support um, th this motion to, to prioritise strongly and, and leave the carpeted areas of the CEO and Lord Mayor that were only carpeted in the last council term. Um, I know exactly how old this carpet is because I've got it through my house and it's about 50 years old, is it? What did you say? It's 70 something. Um, the person that laid this carpet had a lot left over and the people that owned our house bought it. And I have no intention of um, replacing it for many years. It's a lovely old Axminster carpet and it's lasted a long time. But the point is it is going to be replaced and probably is due, for it, due to be replaced. But that carpet out there has just been laid. Um, there was no consultation with any of the elected members, so we went with blue and I noticed we seem to follow that with the uh, carpets that we're now buying at great expense and I have no problem with that. But I think to be ripping carpets up and, and the idea that they'll be used in the Colonel Light Centre, well, I'll fly over the moon if that ever happens, it won't happen. It'll be thrown out in a big truck in Prince Alfred Lane and carted away. Um, but I wouldn't mind buying it. It's probably due for my upgrade from yellow to uh, blue, so uh, I'll put my bid in. <laughs> but uh, no, I think we need to strongly prioritise. We've got lots of things to uh, spend money on in this old building and to replace carpets that are only three years old is not one of them. Thank you, councillors. Uh, maybe you could find your Lord Mayor a magic flying carpet while you're at it. Uh, Councillor Milani, if you just sum up, please. Yeah, it's always fun. We go into the budget process and we talk about all the things that we want to do in um, this city and at Valley. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, pick a, a dollar here, a dollar there to do all the things that we want to do in the public realm. And uh, I don't think we need to waste money on replacing carpet that was just placed in the last few years. Um, and uh, I don't want to be the carpet police. This is not usually my thing. I don't want to. I, I'm normally the, the person that you know is encouraging these things. But um, I just don't see rhyme or reason um, of what's going on in, in 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 those two rooms to replace the carpet. Um, but I do acknowledge the report and the experts, and it's, and it's, it's been a thorough job. And so, well done on on that. Um, and uh, I look forward to, I can't wait to see the Queen Adelaide room actually. It's kind of been under wraps for so long, I'm, I haven't seen it yet, I'm not sure if anyone else has, but I'm very excited to see it and I hope we celebrate that. This is the public's um, building, we have to maintain it um, and we have to you know, invest in it. Um, and uh, so I, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing that at all, I just think that um, it's just not a priority for us right now, and I hope we take the full financial year and we, we you know, use that wisely. And Councillor Brown, I'm sure we'll give you a good price for the uh, other carpet. Thank you, Councillor. Members for the vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, Members. Uh, members, which I now then take you on to Item 12.11, uh, which is a progress of motions by elected members. It's to note members. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Corbell, seconded by Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Corbell, do you wish to speak to this? Deputy Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak to this? Members, do you have any questions about this? You don't? Summing up, Councillor Corbell? Members, those in favour? Sorry, members, can I see some hands, please? Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you very much. Members, questions on notice, of which we have four questions on notice from uh, Councillor Martin. And members, I must say, uh, whilst uh, we welcome questions on notice, I must encourage you, members, there is a trend of uh, growth in the number of questions on notice. I would say that most members uh, would have many questions throughout the course of any given week and would typically uh, deal with them by asking the CEO, which is entirely appropriate way of addressing most of the matters which you may contemplate during any given week. Uh, we have many important matters to debate in this chamber in the interest of uh, maintaining smooth and proper meetings. I would like to say, members, that I uh, 
uh, don't entirely endorse this growth in the trend of questions on notice, which I believe can otherwise be dealt with by our CEO during the normal course of business. On that matter, uh, or to that end, I then hand you to Councillor Martin with regards to item 13.1, first question on notice. The councillor, would you like to take your question as read? Question is read, thank you, Lord Mayor. Okay, members, this uh, matter, uh, the answer to this matter is, uh, is the uh, members, would you like me to take this as read? Would you like me to read it to you? Second read. Uh, Lord Mayor, um, we telecast this, and therefore uh, those people watching this, and I'm assured by the administration that literally hundreds watch every Tuesday evening and hang on every word on soft furnishings and other matters, I think it would be advisable to read the response. Members, in this instance, I will read this response because I'm going to be entirely consistent. Whilst I do want all members to note my aforementioned comments regarding questions on notice, this is a trend which I would like to see reversed. I believe a lot of these question members can be answered very aptly by our CEO, that is his job, and our administration during the course of business during any given week. However, members, in the interest of consistency, which you look to me for, I typically do read the answers to questions on notice should they be less than a page. These certainly are that. The Local Government Elections Act 1999 governs campaign donations, and every candidate, whether successfully elected or not, is required to complete a campaign donation return disclosing that particular donations have been received. Similarly, once elected, various disclosures are required to be made in the primary and ordinary returns. The acceptance of a campaign donation alone will not give rise to a conflict of interest. However, it is each elected member's responsibility to consider whether he or she has a material conflict or perceived conflict of interest, depending on the matter to be discussed before the Council Committee and the nature of the relationship with the individual organisation that provided the donation. So members, this will be put on the public record. I then take you to item 13.2. Councillor Martin, I presume that you would take your question as read? Yes, Lord Mayor. Members, the answer to question point two in the interest of consistency is clauses 2.15 and 2.16 of the Code of Conduct for Council Members create an obligation for Council Members to report to the Lord Mayor, CEO, Ombudsman or the OPI when they form an opinion that another council member has breached part three of the code and a failure to report an alleged or suspected breach is itself a breach of part two by a member who holds the opinion. It is, however, an obligation that is visited upon council members only and not the administration. That part of it would answer your question, Councillor Martin. Further, the prescribed code of contact for council employees does not impose any equivalent obligation upon the administration. Members, item 13.3, I presume you'll take as read, Councillor Martin. The answer is the administration is approached on a regular basis by supporting clubs, including the Adelaide Football Club, property developers, community groups, and many others in relation to ideas for the City of Adelaide. More often than not, these do not progress beyond an initial discussion. Any specific formal proposal is presented to Council for consideration respecting commercial and confidence provisions. There is no active discussion between administration and the Adelaide Football Club currently and no formal proposal has been re received. Members, I must note with some degree of irony here that, uh, members, a discussion about unique proposals was actually put before you very recently, which you didn't debate, you deferred. So, uh, members, I then go to item 13.4. Councillor Martin, you take it as read? Yes. The answer is, travel, accommodation and associated costs for council staff to participate in the missions to China in 2017 and 2018 are estimated at $5,000 per person. The number of staff required to assist with the mission will be determined when the agenda is confirmed and the number of businesses council will host is finalised. Additional costs, including interpretation, gifts, room hire and entertaining, are estimated at $2,000 for each mission. Full costs will be reported to Council following each mission. So, members, from this point onwards, I will be taking a more assertive stance when it comes to questions on notice. I want this Council to be strategic in its deliberations, and what I would determined to be business as usual, I think you can handle during the course of any given week. Members, we move on to questions without notice, item 14. Councillor Martin. 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. Notwithstanding your criticism, follow-up questions related to those questions on notice. Um, with regard uh, to the response in respect of travel, accommodation and associated costs for uh, the coming trip to China in 2017 and 2018, it now appears that the cost of the visit has been revised from $7,000 to $10,000 for elected members and an estimated $2,000 for entertainment, gifts and the like, uh, with still no information with regard to staff. Could the administration please advise whether there are any particular obstacles to meeting the motion of this chamber in uh, 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 late 2016, which said clearly that Council adopts as policy the sentiment of the motion put to the 2016 National General Assembly of Local Government that in addition to international travel by councillors being pre-approved at an open council or committee meeting, the likely cost to rate payers of such proposed travel will be provided at the same time that approval is sought. Councillor Martin, I apologise profusely. I may have been reading too fast, but what I just read in fact was the uh, answer to your question with regards to anticipated staff costs. And the anticipated costs regarding elected members, I understand, were addressed and brought to this chamber's consideration on the 14th of March 2017. Does that assist you, Councillor? No, it doesn't, Lord Mayor. The intention of the motion that was adopted as policy by this council was for the costs to ratepayers of proposed travel be provided at the same time the approval is sought. That is not the case. The cost has been revised since last uh, council meeting and there is still not the information that is required by policy. And so my question is, what is the impediment to the administration providing the information as a matter of policy? We'll refer that to our CEO, Councillor Martin. Through you, Lord Mayor, the, the motion 7.8 travel regarding, as, as debated by the National General Assembly, um, is in two parts. One, uh, that councillor expenses Expense claims should be fully disclosed periodically on the council website. That occurs. International travel by councillors should be pre-approved in an open council or committee meeting, including the likely cost of rate payers of the proposed travel. That occurs. Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, any further questions without notice? Lord Mayor, look, I'm, I, that doesn't actually uh, satisfy uh, the question, but look, I'll put it on notice again. Uh, further to the question with regard to the North Adelaide Aquatic Centre, um, it appears that administration concedes that historically it has been approached by the Crows over the use of the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Why has the administration not included, as requested in the question on notice, a chronology of any meetings, site visits, correspondence including emails or dialogue with the Crows, or, and I ask uh, this question directly of the CEO, would it be appropriate for me as an elected member to lodge a freedom of information request? God. CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I can, all I can tell you is that um, at this time, it's not possible for council staff to answer those questions directly. It's not proper for us to do so. Um, at the instruction of Council, happy to do so. So I motion on notice to the effect that Council provide a full report detailing any of those items would be well received um, at the direction of Council. So that is something that you may wish to consider. Thank you, Lord Mayor, I will do that. And further, uh, with regard to conflicts of interest in terms of campaign donations, uh, the response does not answer the question, does a conflict arise if a donor to an elected member um, influences that elected mo uh, member subsequent to the donation and on the basis that that person is elected. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that, Lord Mayor. Uh, members, may we hark back to my original discussion? That is seven questions. Uh, four questions on notice, uh, almost three without. And for these very reasons, members, I want, you want, we want this council to be strategic in its deliberations. So we, uh, we have staff, 
Uh, we have members who are investing their valuable time in determining the future of our city, and I would suggest members that many matters can be solved by simple engagement with our CEO. We are all interested members, as you know, in transparent government. Of course we are, that's why we're here. However, members, uh, I, uh, Councillor Martin mentioned the words freedom of information. I would suggest that uh, he's already uh, adopted that stance with regards to some of these questions. I, I have to say I find this a little inappropriate in terms of the uh, insistent uh, nature of, of these questions. And I hope, members, you take that debate positively, but I am interested in your time and this council being strategic in its deliberations. Lord Mayor, I, look, I accept, I accept I the point. There's the implied threat to the councillors, the implied cloud of inappropriate and maladministration that these, these questions are seeking to set up. If the councillor knows somebody or suspects somebody has behaved improperly, I think he should go under the confidential provisions to our CEO. I'm sick and tired of listening to these pointed leading questions as to who has a conflict of interest, whose campaign donation, donator has led to them. It is clear the implication here, and I think it's really up to you, Lord Mayor, the CEO, to stop this nature of questioning that this councillor seems intent on continuing with. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Do I have any further questions without notice before I move this meeting on? Councillor Clarehan. Um, Lord Mayor, my question relates to a recent invitation from uh, the Renewal SA and all state government about uh, the CEO and one of our general managers attending a study tour uh, to the United States and Europe, I understand. and. Uh, I also understand that um, members of the opposition, as well as members of the government, ministers of the government, will also be accompanying uh, Renewal SA on this trip. And I have absolutely no issue with any of that. Um, I, I think it'll be fantastic for our CEO and general manager uh, to, to be able to accompany um, Renewal SA and, and ministers and members of the opposition on this trip. My only question relates to why hasn't a um, city councillor been invited to uh, accompany our CEO and our general manager on this tour, given that there are ministers and members of parliament from the opposition also attending this study tour? Can I refer that question to the CEO, please, members? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I can't fully answer that question. All I can tell you is that an invite came to my office and also went to the Lord Mayor's office. Um, the Lord Mayor, because of other trips, um, I understand, would, would find it difficult to attend. It is a study tour. There are about 25 to 30 people attending. Um, and so, therefore, from an operational point of view, I considered it relevant for key staff to attend. Um, so I don't have a good enough answer for you as far as a council member attending, um, and it could be a determination of council. Well, uh, I'm just wondering, um, given that there are um, councillors who are very interested in those planning matters, who have a history of um, participation in policy matters as, a, as it relates to planning, um, who would would be able to um, yeah, all right, I'll get there. Who would be able to both learn and provide Adelaide City Council appropriate policy and thinking? Um, my question is: Is it possible for us to nominate, given that the Lord Mayor is also unable to attend? Is it possible for us to request that a City Councillor also attend if Adelaide City Council pays for their attendance? Through you, Lord Mayor, there are two components to this study tour. Certainly the UDIA component, we could request um, the ability for a council member to attend that. Um, the Renewal SA component was by invitation only at this stage, so I'm not sure, but we could also make that inquiry. I think it's more likely that the UDIA component could well be uh, entered into by council by council member. Thank you. I would really appreciate that. And if we could be given some information pertaining to that, um, I think uh, we'd all be very interested uh, in the opportunity to send a city councillor. 
Thank you, Councillor Clearahan. Members, no further questions without notice. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to take you on to item 15, which is motions on notice. Councillor Martin, 15.1. I have withdrawn the item. Lord Thank Lord. you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Corbell, item 15.2, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I seek a second for the motion on notice. You have a second to a Councillor Moran. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, this motion picks up on a motion that Councillor Moran actually moved earlier this month about major events in the parklands and their relationship to um, the state government major events and how um, we need to be able to, existing businesses in the parklands need to be able to um, coexist with these major events as they have impacts upon. Lord Mayor, I'm sorry, I've just cottoned on to what we're talking about and I need to declare a conflict. What's your reasoning to be Lord Mayor? Um, because I'm members? a board member of the uh, festival and because the festival at times runs events in the parklands, and, um, I've been advised that I need to remove myself. The decision is yours. Thank you for notifying your fellow members. Lord Mayor, sorry. Um, I'm also on a board of an, uh, an event in the parklands. However, I don't, I don't see this is, this, this, I don't see how this correlates to, I just want some clarity about this is about parking, um, public access. This is not about um, any um, commission on sales for park. Well, I, can I just get some clarity on that? Maybe from the Speaker. So, Wigan is a governance advice, please, Sue. Uh, Lord Mayor, excuse me, just before we proceed with that, I'm a member of the Adelaide Festival Centre Trust and it runs events in Elder Park. Are based on councillor um, or a deputy mayor's conflict of interest statements, I do believe I'll have to declare likewise and absent myself well, from the discussion. I, I actually think on. the deputy lord mayor has been given some bad advice, and I, I, it's her call. But councillor Bear, now would you like to hear advice from administration before I you leave the chamber? Advice, you you would. Um, would you like to hear some advice from administration, councillor Malani? Okay, CEO. Very uh, through the presiding member, my understanding was that the initial um, two motions that were put forward were um, so direct that it meant um, a conflict could be perceived. My understanding was that um, the broadness of this motion in terms of addressing policy rather than individual events was broad enough um, to enable um, us to take that away. Um, and bring that back as part of a policy um, discussion uh, when we bring the Adelaide Parklands Events Plan back into the chamber further down the track. But I, I see Mr Decoe's here, so um, I know he has been um, involved if he wishes to add to this. Whilst we're waiting for him, can I just seek some clarity? Because, um, and this is a motion on notice, so it's Councillor Corbell's motion, but this is, uh, this says, um, that parking is maintained for parkland users. That where possible, there's you know coexistence with tenants. That you know we give where possible cyclists and pedestrians access. That's just where possible. We do our best to to bring harmony. I don't see any conflict. Members, I'll just remind you. Of course, the ultimate decision about declaring a conflict is yours to make. But we'll take that advice. Rudy Deco, are you going to speak to this matter? Um, through the law, may material conflict of interest may exist um, if the matter that's discussed at the meeting uh, may result not necessarily in a benefit but also potentially a loss, um, whether directly or indirectly, uh, depending on the outcome of the consideration of the matter at the meeting. So, really, can I ask a question? If I ensuring pedestrian and cycling access to parkland users, who determines whether that's a, a, a better for a lot for a, or a loss? It's a class of people. I mean, it's you know, it's like. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this uh, with this report, so it's hard for me to comment on that. Um, Members, if I can assist you, of course, you do have the choice of declaring and staying or declaring and going. So you do have that at your disposal. I think we've already declared it. Um, well, but it's a dark day when I have to say um, a, a motion where Councillor Corbell is trying to um, 
you know, ensure public access for cyclists and pedestrians in parklands when their events are on. It's a dark day that I can't say that's a good idea. There's a conflict. There's no conflict. I don't think there is either. Claire, do you wish to make a comment? Uh, through the presiding member, um, what this motion does is ask us to investigate the viability um, where possible. So my understanding is that we will take this away, investigate the possibility, um, and then bring that back into the chamber further down the track. You're not making a decision tonight on whether you um, want to pursue these options, but we will take it away and we will look at ways in, we can, in which we can strengthen the Parklands Events Management Plan, but obviously that will be um, brought back to, to Council. So. Lord Mayor, I was very happy to participate in this discussion and the determination, but when um, the Deputy Lord Mayor absented herself because she's a member of the festival, uh, trust. It then made me alerted me to the fact, well, given I am a member of the Adelaide Festival Centre Trust, which has events in Elder Park, does that then uh, also, if she's had advice on that, why wouldn't that advice apply to me also? And that's my dilemma. And entirely, Councillor Farahan, of course, the ultimate decision on this matter is yours and the provisions of the Act. Well, I think I'll, given that there's been advice given, I will, I will has, has um, it, has take it play it safe. Has advice been given? Myself. Can I just get clarity? Has advice been given to Deputy Lord Mayor Hender from this council administration on the conflict of interest? Through Lord Mayor, we're not aware of any advice being given outside of this meeting. So no, we didn't, we didn't go and get any legal advice? No. Not on this particular topic, I don't believe. Kylie Bennett's might be able to help us. <laughs> Timely return. You've been to watching on the TV screen. <laughs> I mean, this is through the presiding member on this particular motion on notice. Uh, we haven't provided any advice, certainly not in the last week, nor have we sought any legal advice on that matter. All right, well then I will stay in the room then if there's no legal advice for the Thank you, Councillor Perahan. Councillor Marnie, your position on this? Um, well, when, when um, you are in the, you're a director of an entity that has an event in the parklands, ironically, it's when you're in uh, the room with that, with that entity, you know, you, uh, my, my priority is as a director to that entity under um, law to do the best thing by that entity. So in that case, I am going to choose to leave. I just give you my, that's now that I'm reading what you're saying. It is my job to actually represent the best interests of that entity. So I'll let you debate it, um, and I'll leave. Noted, councillor. So members, we hold a quorum. Okay. No, sorry, guys. Sorry, I'm going to play it safe and go. Members, we lose a quorum. So I'm going to. Uh, members, I hope that uh, uh, a deep sense of paranoia has not descended upon this council. Um, I'm going to need to call the members back in because we need to do what we did previously in this meeting uh, and then uh, debate an alternate motion which may be a deferral. So if I can invite the members back in, please come. Members, I have a quorum back in the chamber, so members, I'm back in your hands. Councillor Moran? I move deferral of this motion to the next council meeting. Seconded by Councillor Antic. Councillor Moran, you wish to speak to it? Uh, no. Any debate, members? Councillor Moran, sum up. Summed up. Members, those in favour? Those against? Matter deferred for two weeks. Okay, uh, members, item 16, motions without notice. Do I have any motions without notice? 
I don't, so I move to item 17. Uh, members, this is uh, motions to exclude. We have uh, three, four matters uh, to exclude. So 18.1.1, can I have a mover to exclude, please, members? Councillor Corbell, seconded by Councillor Moran. Any debate? Those in favour to exclude? Hands up, members. Those against, we carry. Item two, sorry, 18.2.1. Can I have a mover to exclude, please, members? Councillor Rand, seconded by Councillor Corbell. Any debate, members? I put it to the vote. Those in favour? Item 18.2.2. Move to exclude. Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Clearahan. Any debate? Those in favour? Those against, we carry. Item 18.2.3. Can I have a mover to exclude, please, members? Councillor Moran, seconded by. Councillor Slama. Any debate? Those in favour? Those against, we carry. So, members, we've moved four items into confidence. Can I look to the room? Any uh, persons not directly associated with these matters, can I please ask that you leave the chamber? Thank you kindly for your attendance.
open this mark, this uh, this music, this meeting uh, back into the public. Okay, members, thank you kindly for your participation, contribution and interest. Thank you to administration. Thank you to our CEO. I formally declare this meeting closed at 8.37pm. Members, thank you. Thank you.